When most people hear the word telegraph, they normally think of something like this. A trained operative tapping away at a message in Morse code. Samuel Morse's contribution to telegraph technology was enormous and a real game changer, but it all started long before that. Before we move on, if you enjoy this video, please click on like and subscribe if you haven't done so already and share it with your friends. To do this, you'll be using the technology which, which was effectively started by the subject of this video. Human beings have always strived to find ways of sending messages quickly and over long distances to each other, sometimes by sound with trumpets and drums and later cannons. Ships used flags to signal quite complex messages to each other, and this system survived until the early 20th century when onboard radio evolved. But signalling by flags and lights continued for a long time and is still used today when radio silence is necessary. But it was in the 18th century that an optical telegraph system that could send more complex messages really began to evolve, especially in the two most powerful nations at the time, France and Britain. The system was first developed in France, but it was very quickly adopted by France's global rival, Britain. The French started using the word telegraph uh, from tele, for far and distant in ancient Greek, and graph, meaning writing in the same language. By the time of Napoleon, France had an extensive telegraph system that could send complex messages from Paris all over the country and to its armies even further afield. Messages between the Admiralty and London went on to travel at great speeds. The British Admiralty set up its first telegraph system in 1795 and it was a chain of 15 telegraph relay sites from London to the port of Deal in Kent. Messages could travel this distance of more than 80 miles in about 60 seconds. By 1808, there were over 65 sites in use. The French system was more extensive. As you can see, both systems used kind of arms in daylight and lights at night. Telegraph Hill which is now in a suburb of London, is called so because it hosted one of these early relay stations. The situation might have rested there. The system was expensive and took a lot of skilled labour to operate. And while it was sometimes used for commercial purposes, its use was not very widespread. However, the situation changed with the spread of, you guessed it, the railways. As we know, railway locomotives had been in development since the beginning of the 19th century. This is a reproduction of Richard Trevithick's train that was built in Shropshire in 1808. In 1830, the first intercity railway was built between Liverpool and Manchester, and this was qu quickly followed by a host of other railways. The railway boom had begun. The railways had a problem, safety or lack of it. The problem was that trains were f the fastest means of transport that humanity had ever known. So how can you signal anything to a train when it's going faster than anything else that could catch up with it? Apart from dealing with junctions, one of the biggest dangers was that a fast moving train could crash into a slower train ahead of it on the line. One solution was the employment of what were called railway policemen. They were not policemen in the way we think of the word today. Each one policed a stretch of the line. During the daylight hours, they signalled passing trains with a green flag if another train had not passed recently. The time period was generally about 10 minutes. If the train had passed in less than 10 minutes before, the driver, the, sorry, the policeman waved a red flag and the train would come to a halt or at least slow down. At night, they used coloured lamps. There was also another problem. Watches were expensive and most railway policemen were very poorly paid. To save money, many of them were issued with sand timers, which are basically like the egg timers you see in a lot of kitchens today. The sand would run out at 10 minute intervals. 
When a train passed, the railway policeman would turn it over and would not allow another train to pass until the sand had run out again. This was even more important because don't forget, a lot of early trains were not fitted with brakes. Yes, really. The driver had to throw the engine into reverse to stop the train. Something had to be done. Why not use a telegraph system? It was just at this time that people were experimenting with electricity. Electricity had been around for a long time, and finally uses were being found. If you could run a cable between stations or between signal boxes, then an impulse transmitted could be replicated at the destination via electromagnetic motors. The telegraph was born. The first commercial electric telegraph was installed at Euston Station to Camden Town, a section of Robert Stevenson's London to Birmingham Railway in 1837, and it was used for signalling rope, the rope hauling of locomotives. But why stop here? If you can signal stop and go, you can signal anything, but how to write the messages and how to read them. The company Cook and Wheatstone installed a system first on the London to Birmingham Railway, which used a needle system that you can see here. There were various versions of this system. The one you can see here is probably the final version. Here are two machines. The one on the left is transmitting and the one on the right is receiving. Naturally, the situation could be reversed. You can see that in the middle, five double-headed arrows, which are controlled by five leaders, which can be moved up, down, or stay in the middle neutral position. Nearly all the letters of the alphabet are either above or below these arrows. If the person transmitting wants to send the letter G, then he moves the third and fifth lever to the up position so that both arrows point at the letter G. Further along the track, the receiving machine will move in the same way, and the person receiving the message can write G. You can see the same thing here for the letter S, but in this case, the second and fourth levers are pulled down to signal the letter S in the bottom half part of the machine. The system was very popular and had the advantage that even a relatively unskilled person could use it. However, just as the system was being adopted all over the place, another system was invented that despite the fact it needed trained and skilled operatives to use it, soon became the standard for telegraph all over the world. Of course, I'm talking about Morse code. Samuel Morse was born in 1791 and died in 1872. He was an American inventor and painter, born in Charlestown, Massachusetts. Morse initially pursued a career as a painter and achieved some success in the arts. However, he became increasingly interested in science and technology. Morse's interest in communication was sparked by the slow pace of news delivery. In 1832, while sailing from Europe to the United States, he independently conceived the idea of electromagnetic telegraphy. Yet another example of technology being introduced or being invented by more than one person at the same time. This is a topic I've covered on several other occasions in previous videos, and I'll leave links to these videos in the description below. By 1838, he had developed a working telegraph and Morse code, a system of dots and dashes representing letters and numbers. Morse code allowed messages to be sent very quickly and efficiently over long distance using these electrical signals. While this code was developed over subsequent years, the basic principle was to remain standard for a long, long time. The invention of the telegraph combined with the Morse code wasn't just confined to the railways, but went on to be used for news, business information and personal messages over long distances. The advantage that the railways gave it was there was a highway where the telegraph wires could be laid or more frequently suspended from poles. It all had a profound effect on commerce, diplomacy and daily life, leading to the development of the global communication networks. Within a few years, the telegraph had spread all over the world. Instantaneous communication linked every important cities. Empires, like the British Empire, quickly recognised the strategic importance of the telegraph 
and took it under state control. The first transatlantic cable was laid as early as 1858. It was not particularly effective, but lessons were learned and other cables soon followed. In fact, the majority of transatlantic cables from Europe passed through Britain first, and this meant that during the First World War, Britain was able to intercept German telegrams to the North and South America. The telegraph ushered in what has been called the first age of globalisation, which lasted from the middle of the 19th century through to the beginning of the First World War in 1914. Markets in one part of the world affected markets everywhere else. It was a truly massive game changer on a parallel with the railways and the internet. So what's going to come next? Let me know what you think. Bye for now.